All right, good.
come to Devonshire this morning as we gather to worship the Lord. Every service, we begin with a call to worship and as a reminder that worship, it doesn't begin with us, but it begins with God. And so hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord is faithful, isn't he? He has his faithfulness that has brought you here today. And so let's hear this invitation and run to the outstretched arms of our faithful God. Let's open with prayer this morning as we meet. God, Father, in heaven we come to you this morning grateful for your kindness to us. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in a place like this to, to sing, to extol your name, to sing of your greatness and your goodness. Lord, and so in this time, we ask that you would be um, just present here. We know you promised that you are. And so we just ask that you would make us more aware of your presence this morning and all that you are and all that you mean to us. And we give you all the worship and all the praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Now unto the King who reigns over all.
Let's pray this prayer of confession together. Father, while we know you are forever faithful, we are tired, Lord. We are weary of the long night without rest. We grieve for ourselves as we grow hardened to the pain of others. Another death leaves us unmoved. Our brothers and sisters' tears fall unnoticed. Oh God, help us fight for your kingdom with love. Give us your faithfulness, give us your mercy, give us your compassion, because without your Spirit's help, we are powerless. We come to you because we know you give grace to the weary. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you meet us in the morning with the love that casts us on you. You are working in our waiting, sanctified.
God's word to his broken people. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. When we sin, God is still a God of unending love and faithfulness. He offers us grace and mercy that we don't deserve. Our sin is great, but Jesus' blood is far greater still. There's no failure that outreaches God's ability to forgive, and so let's continue to trust and to sing of God's unfailing love.
consider his faithfulness in providing for us. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink, enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today um, just with life around us uh, seeming more out of control and um, just the cost of everything increasing, Lord. We just need to remind us today to focus back on you. You provide for us each and every day in ways that we may not see or acknowledge. And today we thank you for all of that. We pray for the church, for the tithes and offerings that come that will continue to advance your mission in our community. And we pray for each and everyone here today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, good morning. Welcome to Devonshire. It's good to worship with you today. Um, if you're new to our church family, if you're visiting with us, thanks for coming. Uh, we'd love to get a chance to meet you and say hello. And so if you could, there's a Connect card in the pew in front of you. We'd love if you could fill that out and get it to us in the back so that we could say hello. Uh, if you're worshiping online today, thank you. And uh, please reach out on the website. So let us know that you're here. And, and we'd love to introduce ourselves and see how we can be praying for you. So uh, some announcements to bring to your attention. Uh, there in the bulletin, uh, on August 28th, um, we have a cornhole and picnic in the park. Uh, we've done this last couple of years. We've gone out to Lamplight towards the end of the summer. Uh, this gives everybody in the church a great opportunity to get together, um, to, to have a meal, just have some fun, and, and catch up and see how things are going. It's a, a good opportunity to fellowship uh, and be together as a church family. So even if cornhole is not your thing, uh, this is a great opportunity to come on out um, and, and be together. And so uh, go ahead and mark your calendars for that. That's coming up on the 28th. Um, also, we have a service day that is coming up in September. And so we talked a little bit about that a few weeks ago. I wanted to circle back around because uh, we've nailed down some opportunities, uh, some specific opportunities for us to get involved. And so this is a great way for us as a church to be out in the community and be involved in some things. If you look out on the website, um, there's three different opportunities that you can sign up for with Bridge of Hope uh, and with the uh, Parks Department. Uh, we're aiming for the morning, so about 9 a.m. to 12, uh, to get people out and, and be a part of those initiatives. And so what we're asking for you today is to go out to the website and to sign up. We'd love to have a lot of people involved in that. We'd love to make a big difference there. So out on the website, if you can go take a look there and sign up. And then lastly, um, don't like to admit it, but we're getting towards the end of the summer. We're heading into the fall. Um, and we've got a lot of great ministry opportunities going on. Um, many of those are listed in the bulletin. Many and more are going to be coming up here in the fall. Um, our ministry leaders um, are looking for some volunteers to help out in their different areas. And so if you would like to get involved, um, if you could help out in some of these things, our ministry leaders would love to touch base with you uh, and, and get some extra hands on some of these projects that we're looking to get into in the fall. And so there's some information there in the bulletin. If you could reach out to the church office, we can get you connected with the right people if God's laying it on your heart to work in a specific area or if you just want to get involved. Uh, and so with that, I think that is it for announcements. So why don't you go ahead and stand and take a moment to greet one another.
All right. Well, it is good to be together this morning to uh, just to worship the Lord and uh, to come and to just look closer at his word and just be together as a, as a church family. And uh, so if you're visiting with us this morning, we're so glad that you've chosen to join us for worship and uh, just hope that already you've been just blessed by your time. Um, we'd love to further connect with you. Uh, and so in the pew rack in front of you, there's a connect card and uh, we just love to, to get to know you more. So this morning we're going to be looking at... Uh, at peace and talking about peace. Over this summer, we've been going through and just talking around in this series about who is it that we are becoming. As we stay close, as we stay connected to the Lord, uh, what kind of fruit is there then? What is it that characterizes the fruit of our lives and, and what we bear in that? And so our goal has really been to grow in our knowledge and our understanding and our view of the Lord, of God, and understand that as we're connected to Jesus, we're going to become more like Jesus. As uh, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, uh, we've read over this passage over the past few weeks a number of times, and so we're going to keep on doing that as we're working through um, basically a list of these characteristics of these fruit, um, the fruit of the Spirit. And in verse 22 and 23, here's what Paul says. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, patience, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And, uh, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And so as we pursue Jesus, as we desire to know him more and more, uh, our lives get to be shaped in these ways, which is really a picture of, of who Jesus is and what he is like. Um, and so this is a simple concept. As someone follows after Jesus, they're going to look more like Jesus. Uh, a week or so ago, Noah and I, we went out to a golf course. This is something that we'd never do. Um, we are not golfers, but we were like, ah, oh, we had a free night. Let's go and check out this driving range thing. And uh, so Noah and I, we walk into, I guess they call, it a, they call it a pro shop. I don't know. Is that what they call it, golfers? Yeah. So we walked in. It's, it's not what it's called. When we walked into this place, I, I asked my questions. I don't know what the etiquette is and, and all this. I just feel like don't know. And Noah's probably just, he walks away. He's like, oh, Dad, you know, what are you talking about? <laughs> I saw him do it. And uh, so he got the token. We went out, and we got the basket of balls, and, and we just uh, started trying. And uh, there were a lot of misses. There was a lot of the ball going the wrong directions, and some did go the right direction, and we had a fun time, but the reality is, I know, like, we are not golfers, we know nothing about what we're doing, and if we wanted to get better at it, we would find someone who, it is their game, right? We'd talk to them a little bit more about, um, well, you know, what it is that we're trying to do, form, I guess, um, what's important, keep your head down is what I hear, and uh, just, we'd learn, and we'd spend time with it, and Probably the more that I spent time with whoever that person is, we're going to improve our game. And maybe our game might even look a little bit more like that other person's game who's telling us how to do it because we're learning from them. And in the same way, in our relationship with the Lord, as we spend time with him, as we get to know him more and his spirits at work in us, we're going to start to um, begin to look more and more like him. It's what we call sanctification. Um, and so here's the thing, though. We can't do this without the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Colossae, he tells them that he's giving all that he has for the Lord. Like, everything about his life is for the sake of Christ. And he's desiring to be faithful to proclaiming the good news of the gospel. But do you see whose energy he's doing it all with? You know, we know this passage in Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. He makes it clear that it's not on his own energy that he even has a chance of doing this. But it is all because of the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. He says this in verse 28. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. He's saying this is what our lives are all about. It's all about Jesus. It's in everything that we're doing. We want to make his name known so that we may present everyone mature in Jesus. And then he says this, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy. It's not struggling with all my energy. He's struggling with all of his energy that he powerfully works within me. Oh, how we need him, right? We need him. Like this morning, uh, we were thinking about singing the song of, I need thee every hour. Um, like, I need thee. Oh, I need thee. 
just singing that out to God, like, I need your help to do this, to live this life in the face of temptation, in the face of, of the hard things in this life. God, we need you. And so as we've talked about the fruit of the Spirit that's characterized as love, joy, um, and last week, David, Brother David, thank you so much for, uh, for your message last week of encouraging us uh, in regards to self-control and who is it that's truly in control of our lives. And this morning, we want to come back, as you can see, self-control is at the end of the list. We're going to jump back. I don't know how that happened, um, but we're going to come back, and this morning, we're going to talk about peace. As we look throughout Scripture, we're called to be a people who are at peace with others. Like, God's people are to be peace, people of peace. Here's what Paul says in Romans 12, verses 17 and 18. He says it this way, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. It's a hard thing at times, isn't it? Just to live peaceably as far as it depends on you. Let that be what shapes your life and characterizes you, that you're one who is doing whatever you can do to be at peace with others. But where is it that this peace comes from ultimately for the believer? If we aren't people of, who are at peace, then we're not going to be a people who are characterized by peace, right? So where does this peace come from? And the answer is, is that it comes from a confidence. It comes from a rest and trust in the Lord. And so this week, as we come around this, I want to take us back to, to looking at a story in Judges chapter 6, where we find the story of a man named Gideon who found his peace in the Lord. And actually, in this passage, in this chapter, as we look at it, we find the name used for God of Jehovah Shalom, which is translated, the Lord is peace. You've probably heard this word shalom before and know that no, it, it's real connected to the word that means peace, but uh, the word shalom, it means so much more than that. It's hard for one English word to capture the richness of this meaning. It means more than that there is no more violence. It means more that there's no more fighting going on. There's a, there's a di big difference between peace and a truce. President Hoover once said this, peace is not made at the council table or by treaties, but in the hearts of men. And isn't that the truth? Things can be as nice and quiet as they can be, just even in our own families, like with my, with my kids at times, sometimes, especially when they were younger, you know, there may not be, you know, and they've gotten into it, there's a disagreement, there's an argument, someone's mad, while things, people may have gone to their separate places and things are quiet now, that doesn't mean there's any peace, necessarily, right? And in the same thing in all of our lives, like you can have things nice and quiet and there's no fighting, no one's going at each other, but there's not peace in our lives. The general meaning behind this word here as we look at shalom is that of completion, fulfillment, wholeness, unity that's signified by a sense of well-being and harmony both within and without, it has to do with health, happiness, quietness of the soul, there's tranquility, there's security. It conveys this sense of being at peace with God and involves more than just forgiveness of sin in that fullness of life. There's prosperity, there's peace with men. That's the expected result of this shalom. Throughout the scriptures, this shalom, it indicates a total fulfillment that comes when individuals are experiencing God's presence. It is an all-encompassing thing. And so summed up in one sentence, here's the point for us this morning as we talk about peace, and it is that for centuries, God's people have believed and experienced that God is our peace in all circumstances. In every single one of our circumstances, he is our peace. And here's why this is important, and that we're going to look at this this morning, and, and it's probably going to bleed into next week. Um, it's important because all of us at some point, to varying degrees in our lives, that we've had to wrestle with fear, that we have to wrestle with anxiety, that we have to wrestle with stress, that we have to, to wrestle with doubts, insecurity, concerns. There's plenty of things for us to be anxious about in life. Things aren't going maybe the way that we think that they should. All to varying degrees. Maybe we're plagued by worry. And we can be paralyzed from living the life 
that we were created for. And so this morning, we want to just look at what does God's word have to say for us in this story um, that can encourage us, that can help us as we um, face those times. God showed up in Gideon's life and he brought peace in the same way that he does, that he wants to, and that he can in our lives today. And so uh, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Judges chapter 6. And so that we get the context of, of the story, let's read the first 11 verses uh, together, and then we'll just uh, make sure that we understand what's going on. It says this, the, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years, and the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of the Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents and they would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. And when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. And so here, let's just stop there. Here's the story, the context of what's going on here. The Israelites are once again, they're doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord. This is a, this is a characteristic pattern that keeps on being repeated all throughout this book. It's a pattern of, number one, the people abandon the Lord. They go their own ways. They're about their own business. They abandon the Lord. Secondly, then what happens? But God raises up a foreign power to oppress them. And then thirdly, what happens after this happens is the same thing that we see over and over to their unfaithfulness. To the people, they cry out for God's deliverance. And they say, God, would you come? And would you help us? And sure enough, what does God do? because he's faithful, God raises up a deliverer and a judge for them. So this cycle, we can see it just repeated over and over throughout Israelites' history. And in verse 1, we're told that for the past seven years that they've been uh, under the oppressive hand of the Midianites, and they're pillaging them, they're devouring the produce of the land, and they're leaving nothing for the Israelites to have to eat. They wouldn't leave any ox or donkey, and they would come upon them in an oppressive, swarming-type manner, and they would lay waste to the people. And so we're told that because of this hard reality for the Israelites, that they had gone where? They had gone into the mountains, into the caves to live because they were afraid. They literally had to run for their lives, and, and so this is a serious low point in the history for God's people. And so the people, they cry out for help, and God hears their cry, and he sends a prophet with a message. And what's the message of this prophet? The message is that he comes and he just reminds them of this situation, why they're in this situation. It's because of their own doing. He says, it's not my fault that you're having to live in fear like you are, and then reminds them of all that God has done for them about how he led them out of Egypt and how he led them out of bondage and how he had been so gracious and merciful and kind to them over and over and how he had gone before them. And then he tells them that they shouldn't go and they shouldn't worship other gods. And the last phrase of verse 10, it tells us what they decided to do. What was it that that they did? It says, but you have not obeyed my voice. He's saying, I, I did all this stuff for you. God's saying, I did... I provided for you, I led you, I guided you, and I told you how to live. But you have not obeyed my voice. And so that's where we're picking up the story and and where we meet a man by the name of Gideon who God calls to save and deliver Israel. That's the situation. And so let's read on. Let's read the next, uh, up through verse 27 here, starting in verse 11. It says this, Now the angel of the Lord came, and he sat under the terebinth at at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, 
while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all these wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Didn't the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us, and he's given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from me here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. And so Gideon went into the house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. And the meat he put in it in a basket and the broth he put in a pot and he brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on, his, on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. And then the angel of the Lord reached out to the tip of the staff, out the tip of the staff that was in his hand, and he touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. And then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear, you shall not die. And then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord, and he called it, The Lord is Peace. And so to this day, it still stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abizrites. That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. And build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. And then take the second bowl and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. And so Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. All right, so here we are. As we look closer at this story, these are fearful and uncertain times. We can't lose that. We can't miss that because that's the context for where it is, why, and what it's like right now. And we find Gideon, what is he doing? He's doing his work and he's doing it. Is he doing it out in the open? No, he's doing it in hiding. Because where's he at? At the time of this encounter that he has with this divine envoy, Gideon is beating out the grain in a wine press. It's not where you do that, right? That wine press is made for for grapes. This was a sign of the uncertainty of the times. This isn't how would you would normally do things. In the absence of modern technology, grain is threshed out by first beating the heads of the cut stalks with a flail, discarding the straw, and then tossing the mixture of the chaff and the grain in the air, allowing the wind to blow away the chaff while the heavier kernels of grain fall to the floor. And here in these circumstances within which Gideon and the Israelite people find themselves, it would have been unwise for them to be doing this out in the open and on the hilltops because the Midianites would come and just take them, take over. And so Gideon, he's there and he's beating out the grain in a sheltered vat that's used for pressing grapes. Here's the thing about fear. Here's the thing about anxiety. Here's the thing about these things that we all know it can be paralyzing and it can keep us from doing the work and being about what God has called us to do and the life that he has given us to live. You might have heard the story of this uh, conversation that uh, has been given as an illustration at times. Uh, there was a farmer down in the south. He's sitting at his shack smoking his corn cob pipe and along comes a stranger and he says this, how's, how's your cotton coming? And he says, ain't got none, was the answer. Didn't plant no cotton, afraid of the bull weevil. Okay, well, how's your corn? Didn't plant no corn, afraid of the drought. How's your, how about your potatoes? Ain't got none of them, scared of the tater 
bugs. And the stranger finally asked, well, what did you plant? And the farmer answered, nothing. This year, I just played it safe. You know, there's just like you, d- you end up not doing anything because we're fearful. And the point is, the paralyzing power of fear, you feel defeated before you begin. You feel discouraged before you even get started. And it can be a crippling disease and rob us of our lives. We know the power of fear in our lives. And so how do we find peace? How do we deal with fear, insecurity, uncertainty, and anxiety? How do, we, how do we keep on living? And how is it that we can be a people of peace? And this morning, as we look at this passage, I feel like that I know there's some encouragement for us this morning that we need to hear. The first thing is this, that peace comes when we get God's perspective. When we have God's perspective, peace comes. Right off the bat, as we look at this passage, the angel of the Lord says to Gideon, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. The Lord is with you. Gideon pushes back and says, oh yeah? Well, if he was with us, then why are we in this situation? Why are we here? Where are all the good and wonderful deeds that God has done for our fathers that we always heard about, that he's done all these wonderful things? And you see that in verse 13. And I can only imagine that he's thinking, if a mighty man of valor is who I am, then what am I doing hiding down here in this sheltered vat, beating out the wheat? You see, Gideon, he had a perception issue. He was focused on the present circumstances rather than on what God could do. We need to look at things from God's perspective. It's one of the things, you know, isn't it just uh, one of the pluses of getting to fly in a plane that while you're up there, you get a different perspective? You get to see uh, a bigger picture. You get to see the greatness of, of say, the ocean when you're flying or that, or just the the landscape of what's beneath you, the land and the contours of the mountain and everything and how it all fits together and how things are just, they just look different. Things look a lot smaller. And maybe it's if you take a hike and you're up at one of the lookouts and you can just see out before you, everything is so much different looking because of perspective. In his letter to the Philippians, Paul, he addresses this issue of dealing with anxiety And the first counsel that he gives in overcoming the battle of anxiety is to thank God. Thank God for all that he has done and and, and make your request to him. We know this, these verses, right? Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Make your requests known to God. And, And what's the promise? The promise is, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You know, are we coming to him? Do, are we keeping perspective? Peace comes whenever we have God's perspective. Every morning when you wake up, Paul says this, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Getting our perspective right, getting your eyes up, who we are with God is the most important thing. And so peace comes when we get God's perspective. Secondly, peace comes whenever we experience God's presence. Peace comes whenever we experience God's presence. Here in verse 14, it says this, And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? He says, Go. Am I not the one sending you? And then in verse 15, And he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. He's saying, saying, how am I going to do this? There's two objections that I have. Number one, I am part of the weakest clan, uh, Manasseh. And of that, I am the least in my family. I am like way down here. Why do you think I have anything to offer and to do that I could even do this? Why are you calling me? And who we are without God is important. But who we are with God is the most important thing. And how does God respond? Verse 16. But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. What does he say? But I'll be with you. I'll be with you. Like, that's the number one thing that matters, isn't it? Don't miss the point here. As we go through life, and especially as we go through times of doubt and insecurities and fears arise... 
we have to cling to this promise and know that our faithful God is with us. Do you hear it in these verses? Do you see it? God's saying, I will be with you. I will be with you. What happens when you know God is with you? If you know God is with you, you can keep on going to the end. When you know God is with you, you can do the hard thing even whenever you're not sure if you can. There's this confidence that you can have to do whatever you've been called to when you know that he's with you. We need to know that God is with us. And in this little bit that we, God says to Gideon, as he calls him, he says, I will be with you, and he has this personal encounter, and the same thing for us that changes everything, right, is whenever we have that personal encounter with the Lord, when we're staying close to him. There's no shalom that can be experienced without staying close to Jesus. There's no wholeness, there's no contentment to be had apart from Jesus. The shalom that we're talking about, it only comes from spending time in his presence. That's what Jesus said, right? He said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. And so let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. If you're not following Jesus, if you're not staying close to Jesus, if you're not walking with him, the Bible says there's no way that you can have peace. You want to know peace, you have to know him. You've been created to enjoy a relationship with the one who has made you, who has come to save you, but if you've never decided to trust him with your life, if you're not trusting him, there's no peace. If you've decided to follow Jesus, but you're not spending time in his word, and you're not spending time with him in prayer, and in his presence, you're not going to experience peace, because peace comes whenever we get God's perspective, and peace comes whenever we experience his presence. So that's why it's so important for us to spend time in his word. It's so important for us to gather together like this in worship. It's so important for us to spend time with other believers and being encouraged to keep our eyes on the Lord. It's so important for us to slow down and put him first. Because if we don't, we can get consumed by everything else and we lose perspective. Maybe you're here this morning and you've heard this about how God can provide peace and you know that you don't have it. And where you're at right now might be where here at the beginning of this passage is just where you find yourself. The times are uncertain, things are in a fearful situation. You're not sure how we can go on and keep on going. You're afraid to move might seem like the past seven years, the enemy has just kept on coming and coming and coming and stealing and taking everything from you. And you're just keeping going as best you can, always looking for that next person where it's just going to be another hard thing. And there's fear. Here this morning, just for these two things, and we'll hit the rest of it next week. Here's what I want to say. Because I don't think you're here by accident, any of us. God has you here to hear him say, just as he said to Gideon over and over, I will be with you, saying I'm with you. I'm going to be with you through every step of whatever it is you face, and so trust me. Maybe you're here, and the first step that you need to take right now is that of just taking a step of placing your faith and trust in the Lord. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've never said, Lord, I'm all yours And I'm trusting you with whatever it is that you're calling me to do. I'm willing to lay my life down, and I don't know how it's all going to turn out, but I'm placing my trust and my faith in you. Because you're the one who I need to have a relationship with, and I'm looking to the cross, and I know that you've, even though I'm a sinner, totally rebellious in every way, I am trusting that there is forgiveness and there is peace available as I place my faith and trust in what you accomplished for me at the cross. For others of you, maybe you've already placed your faith and trust in Jesus, and you're battling this fear and insecurity and doubts and worry right now. Maybe you're not right now, but someday you will. I want to encourage you to keep on going. It's not always easy to overcome, but keep fighting the battle. In every moment, keep your eyes on Jesus and keep yourself in his presence, in his word and prayer praying for his spirit's 
work in your life. 1 Peter 5, 7 says this, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. He loves you. He cares for you. You can trust him. So this morning as we close in the quiet of this moment, I want to encourage you, cast your cares upon him. They aren't for you to burden. He'll carry them. He loves you. Just admit your frailty and your need for peace and come to him and ask him to fill you with his presence. This morning as we close our time together here, um, part of that is we're going to um, just partake of Holy Communion together where we remember what it is that our Savior accomplished for us on the cross. As we hold the, the elements in our hands, the, the bread and the, and the cup, reminding of, us of his great sacrifice and his great love for us. And it's only because of that that we can truly know peace in our lives. Just allow yourself and just ask the Lord to, um, just to allow you to experience his presence in a special way in this time. And so let's pray, and um, let's bow our heads and just let's ask, Holy Spirit, what is it that you have for me to hear this morning? And if you're here and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, I want to invite you to just maybe pray, the, pray this prayer in your heart, just as an expression of a desire to to surrender your life to him and to know the peace that comes from knowing him as your Lord and Savior. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who's, who's never surrendered their life to you and saying, hey, yes, I want to follow after you, Lord. I'm trusting in you. Lord, may they join with me in, in this prayer of, of surrender, just in saying, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for the things that I've done wrong in my life. God, would you forgive me? I now turn from everything that I know is wrong and know that I can't live for you on my own strength. And so thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your spirit. So Lord, here I am and I'm asking and I'm trusting in you. Lord, would you come into my life by your spirit to be with me forever? Thank you. Lord, for all of us, as we come this morning, it's a similar, it's the same kind of uh, just heart with which we come, is saying, Lord, here we are, we are yours. You know the situations in our lives that we are facing, and and the things that stress, the things that worry, the things which cause us to, to not be secure. Feel that. But Lord, help us to keep our eyes on you and to know that what really matters is the security that we have in you as your children. And so Lord, in this time, God, I ask that you would just awaken us in, in a new way. to your great love for us. Even though while we weren't yet sinners, yet you loved us and you were gracious and you were merciful and you died for us. And so Lord, we thank you for that and we are humbled. In your name we pray, amen. So as we come, I wanna invite the guys to come and we're going to disperse the elements in the pews. And so if you have place your faith and trust in Jesus and you are a follower of Christ, I want to invite you to, to join us as we come to the Lord's table together. Apostle Paul, he said this, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as you receive the elements, just hold them and let's wait to partake of them together.
And so Jesus, he took the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. So in the same way, Jesus, he took the cup and he said, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and drink. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you now. We are just humbled by your mercy. 
We're humbled by your grace, and we thank you for the peace that we can know and that we experience in our lives. Lord, because you came and you paid the price that none of us could ever pay, none of us deserve. But Lord, we are humbled and we thank you for the peace that we can know in our hearts. All because of you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand as we... uh, respond to the peace that we experience in our lives.
have your seats for a second? We have to do one more thing as part of our time together. And uh, Brent, would you come on up? So I know I saw them. There they are. Okay. So Davis says, would you come on up? We're, we want to end our time together um, since all of the, all the family can be with us today. And, and so Clint and Heather and Graham and Corbin, they've gotten to spend, how you doing Corbin? Hi. Hi there, good to see you. <laughs> We've had uh, eight years, right? Right at eight years that um, the Davises have come to be with us here um, in Harrisburg. Uh, he came to serve as a principal, is that what it was right out of the gate? A principal um, out of Harrisburg Christian, and we got to know Heather. She was teaching back here in, in the one classroom out here in the educational college, and then they became part of our f- church family, and we got to spend some years of doing ministry together, and I think you guys have been serving in children's church for the past few years, and it's just been a blessing to have you guys with us and a part of our church family. And so they are relocating to back to North Carolina, their home area, and so we're going to miss having you guys with us up here, And um, but we know that the Lord has you head in that direction, and you have a great piece about it as we've been uh, just talking, and uh, I didn't ask you if you wanted to say anything this morning, but you don't have to. Heather, you wanted to say a lot of things, right? <laughs> <laughs> is there anything you want? Okay. We just wanted to, you know, it's been a joy. The Lord has had, our, had us get to spend these years together. And so we want to, as a church family, pray for them as they head out uh, in the next week or so um, back down to the Charlotte, North Carolina area. So it's been, it's been a great joy. So I asked um, Brent if he would pr- lead us in praying. And so uh, make sure, I know this afternoon from 4 to 8, there's a, a get-together over in the community center. It's just a stop, drop in, and, and say say farewell kind of thing if you would like to. Or make sure you do that here this morning and just let them know that it's just all that they've meant to you. I know in our lives, there's been a lot of ways that you guys have been a blessing to us. And so we, we thank you so much for that. Um, Brent, would you lead us? All right, let's pray. Lord, as we come to you today, uh, we want to uh, reach out to you and look to you for, uh, Lord, your, your leading in our lives. Um, we look to you for the, the peace and, and the understanding that you provide. And, uh, Lord, today we pray uh, with the Davis family, and we, we thank you for their lives, and we thank you uh, uh, for their friendship, and, Lord, the way that they have uh, just become a part of the family, uh, Lord, that they've poured their lives into uh, the lives of the church, lives of the community. Uh, Lord, for Clint and Heather, um, as they've uh, poured, um, Lord, just uh, the gifts that you've given them into our, our children and the children in the community through the school. And um, Lord, their heart uh, just to be a part of a church family and a community. And, and we just thank you so much uh, for their time with us. Uh, we're thankful for Graham and Corbin, um, Lord, and, and the way that uh, we've seen them grow. And, and we pray. Uh, as they head off to North Carolina, Lord, that you would uh, continue to guide their steps, uh, that you would continue to give them peace, Lord, and that you would continue to work in their lives as they serve in your church family, um, Lord, in that area. And so um, we send them off, Lord, with love um, and with peace, and and we pray all the best, um, looking to you uh, for every good thing. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, guys. Um, Make sure you uh, get to connect with them today if you can. Let's all stand um, for our benediction this morning as we go. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.